Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? Among this week's news items, we have Pfizer's response to claims by Veritas that they've been engaging in questionable research conduct. Interesting developments of how fungi are adapting to the different climate they find themselves in today. The plans by a very large biotech company to resurrect the dodo and whether or not this may be a highly questionable and bad idea. DIY gene editing, which is definitely a a bad idea, is now available as a home kit. Research into glyphosate and the surprisingly confident results being claimed from it. The interesting archaeological finds in Zimbabwe of how they developed a system to cope with drought throughout the year the uh, replicability crisis of different kinds of research, how CNET's machine learning AI type robot appears to have a uh, extensive plagiarism problem. The rather pretty but honestly somewhat useless fairy robots that rely entirely on light to move. The timestamps for these and other news items can be found in the description box below. Let's start with Pfizer and Veritas. Veritas is, let's say, well known for sometimes representing things in a less than stunning light. In this case, they recorded claims made by a apparent employee of Pfizer that they were doing gain-of-function research, specifically claiming that they were taking COVID-19 and adding to its genome to give it new abilities. Well, this is obviously a rather big concern. After all, it's one of the theories as to how COVID came about. That gain-of-function research was being conducted with coronaviruses, and somehow this got out into the wild, so to speak. Now, that claim is obviously going to startle people and create something of a panic. The problem is, it doesn't seem to be what Pfizer was actually doing. Now, understand that there is a certain grey area between the two positions, between what Pfizer is saying and what Veritas has claimed. The key here is that Pfizer was not providing gain of function in terms of giving a new ability to the virus. Rather, they were taking new variants of concern, that is, existing variants of COVID-19, and modifying their existing virus to match with this. This allows them to assess the ability of their existing antibodies from their current vaccines, test kits, and anything else they have in the pipeline to be able to neutralize this new variant of concern. So to be clear about it, rather than having to track down, isolate, and refine a new variant, they could simply take the existing one they have, modify it that way, and just recreate what already exists. So this is where that grey area exists. Technically, it is gain of function, as the variant they have doesn't already have that ability. But another variant of the same virus does. So they're not creating a new ability, they're just streamlining the ability to investigate whether or not it works. One of the particular concerns was whether or not their Paxlovid would work for it. Paxlovid from memory being a two-part or two-factor product whether or not one or the other part of it would fail is the concern there. So in short, they're technically not engaging in gain-of-function research. They are genetically modifying existing and known viruses of the same group or family that are closely related to have the same attributes. In doing so, they meet their own regulatory requirements, they're able to test their own products and establish efficacy and theoretically develop new products like new vaccines to deal with them. This is a very different situation to how Veritas has presented it, perhaps simply due to a lack of context more than anything else. In the uh, same vein of research, focusing specifically on COVID-19, there's further evidence that if you have been vaccinated and you are an expecting mother, there's a good chance that your children have a much higher rate of survival than those who are unvaccinated. The reasons for this are not that surprising, but you may or may not know. Some of the antibodies from the mother can cross the placenta to the developing fetus. This is important to protect the fetus from viruses. 
but not all can. This is why the uterus is a surprisingly well-protected place, even from the immune system. It ensures the body doesn't attack the developing fetus. In this case, they looked at vaccination rates between July 1st, 2021 and March 8th, 2022. They then looked at hospitalization rates amongst infants younger than six months of age. They had 30 hospitals in 22 states. By doing this, they are able to account for things like the Delta variant, the Omicron variant, and a few others like the earliest forms of the virus. The results they had were that 537 infants, and 180 of these were admitted to hospital when they had Delta, and 356 during the Omicron period, had been admitted. Of these, 512 were then analysed as part of the study. Among the infants who had not been vaccinated, 21% received intensive care, 12% had to be ventilated, and 2 died. Neither of the infants in the most extreme case, death, had been vaccinated during pregnancy. What was interesting is that the vaccination hospitalisation rates for COVID-19 amongst infants was 52%. This means that the vaccine provided overall a roughly 69% efficacy was observed if vaccination occurred after 20 weeks of pregnancy and 38% if it was during the first 20 weeks of pregnancy. In short, it does work and it doesn't increase issues to do with children surviving. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. Children are more likely to survive. On the topic of survival, let's look at how fungal pathogens are adapting to the changing environment and particularly global warming. The reality is that fungi require a somewhat unique environment, depending on what they are. For example, mushrooms may only predate on certain trees or woods. Sometimes the tree must be living, sometimes the fungus will kill the tree, and sometimes the tree will only be able to be a food source if it's dead. This study specifically looked at Cryptococcus de neoformans. They put it in a laboratory setting, basically a petri dish and an incubator. The conditions of the incubator were between 30 degrees Celsius and 37 degrees Celsius, or roughly 85 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. By changing the amount of heat, Cryptococcus struggled as it got progressively hotter. And this is exactly the situation you would find with climate change. Increasing temperatures, and this is what it has to cope with in the environment. Now that's average temperature, not necessarily local or specific circumstance temperature. Where it gets interesting is that, as with anything that's living, there will be a certain amount of adaptation to the environment. In this case, three genes changed, and these three genes appear to be making them more resilient to the changing climate, and possibly even more resistant to drugs that we already have a somewhat limited stocks of because, well, increasing numbers of microorganisms are resistant. It's something of a catch-22. We use more drugs to deal with more resilient bacteria, thereby creating more resistant bacteria that require more drugs, and the circle continues. The key from this research is not so much that the resistance is there, but that the climate change may be driving some of this resistance, and that is a concern. In a related topic, but this time changing from the environment's temperature and microbes to the human body and our body temperature, the bizarre research, and understand that it is not necessarily conclusive evidence, but interesting by itself, is that the microbes in our GI tract may possibly be contributing to the lowering of the average body human temperature. And again, we are talking about an average here. Specifically, we're talking about the average body temperature during sepsis. That is when the bacteria or something similar gets into the bloodstream and begins to multiply and colonize the blood. This is obviously going to lead to systemic infection, and the way the body deals with this is to engage fever. Fever is how the body raises its temperature and basically tries to make it as inhospitable to foreign pathogens as possible, while giving the immune system the best possible chance of being able to attack them and deal with them quickly and effectively. It also helps to some extent with metabolism and therefore recovery from injury from the sepsis.
How this relates to the GI tract microflora is very simple. Certain species appear to contribute to developing a higher fever. A higher fever is going to be less hospitable to certain microbes, and as a result, the body has a better chance of coming through, therefore the patient with sepsis surviving. This then feeds into the general area of research in that your GI tract and the microbiome within is linked to all kinds of health concerns, some to your benefit, some to your detriment. The selection of certain microbes over time is therefore contributing to the overall health of humanity in different settings, as different peoples will have very different gut microbes. In other news that's somewhat tangentially related to evolution, but in this case, undoing the effects of evolution and natural selection. The plan is to resurrect the dodo, and unlike Jurassic Park, this probably won't end badly for everybody involved, except possibly the dodo. This is a bird that went extinct in the 17th century, for one simple reason. It was incredibly dumb. It didn't understand the threat the humans faced, and it was apparently quite tasty. This meant you basically had a walking bucket of KFC that could be consumed quite easily, and people would travel to the island, find the nearest dodo, and have a meal with it, or from it. This is where the plan to resurrect it is somewhat questionable. The idea is not unheard of. For example, animals like the woolly mammoth or Tasmanian wolf have all been looked at being resurrected the same sort of way. Find a closely related animal that you can, if not modify the genome, at least use as a carrier to bring it back to life. The issue here is that not only are there very few birds that are closely related genetically, but that you would have to have a large number of these birds in order to avoid issues to do with genetic bottlenecks. You'd have to have a lot to provide DNA, so therefore many different samples. You would need to produce them all at roughly the same time, and you would need to find a way to be able to diversify their genes quickly to prevent the population bottleneck, therefore inbreeding and a dodo version of the royal family. Apparently the plan has, let's say, aroused public interest to the tune of somewhere around $150 million. The project claims it's only going to require $225 million, and therefore they are nearly to that goal. The study also expects that by resurrecting this dead animal, they can get a $1.5 billion startup out of it. There are obviously some very serious ethical considerations. Uh, we've mentioned many of these already. There's also arguments that rather than trying to resurrect a dead species, we should focus on conserving species we have now. At the same time, the company behind this has argued that by getting themselves off the ground with this project, they allow for better conservation of those species that are endangered now by having established a system the necessary technology, and the means of keeping animals from going extinct or resurrecting them if they are. In the same sort of news, but focusing specifically on humans and why we may just drive ourselves to extinction. There is currently a DIY gene editing kit available. Yes. It's supposedly using CRISPR to be able to do various questionable things. The idea is that you can modify things, for example, like DIY bacterial gene engineering. This is something that a lot of students who look at genetics in a laboratory as research students, particularly biological, biochemistry, and pharmacology, and even genetics, might have done themselves. A common example is making bacteria fluoresce under a UV light by adding the green fluorescent protein to those bacteria. In fact, the person behind this claims that that's exactly how they got into the idea of being able to do this. The questions here are what exactly it's being offered for, and that's the big problem here. In fact, we've been through this before. We've explained how the whole idea of home-based or DIY genetic engineering 
is prone to all kinds of issues, not the least of which is the lack of regulation. After all, it's not as though you would trust somebody to make drugs in their own backyard, let alone trying to make DNA in their own backyard. The other issues are what this could be used for that are less legitimate means, or more nefarious under the right circumstances. This is not to say that CRISPR and other genetic modification doesn't have a place and role, but giving somebody access to incredibly powerful tools with no understanding of what it is they're doing, just how to do it, is like trusting a kid with a gun. Sure, they might be perfectly fine and do nothing that's an issue, or they might blow their head off. An example of genetic modification that both shows the benefits and demerits of it, and especially if you don't know what you're doing, is in the next article, and specifically the creation of what are described as synthetic cyborg cells. The reason they're called cyborg cells is very simple. They cannot reproduce themselves. They have no ability to divide or grow. This is very important. If you screw with a cell's ability to replicate in any way, shape, or form, it can't contribute to replacing anything that's being damaged. And that's a problem. In order to reproduce, humans must make sperm and ovum. If you want to replace damaged skin cells, if you've, for example, been cut, you need to create the various kinds of cells, and that normally happens by the cells around it dividing, along with the deposition of collagen for scar tissue. Unlike other kinds of cells that have been stuck in the stage where they won't divide, these cells do not lose their function. That means that they can be given a particular task and they will keep doing it until they break down entirely. The key beyond that is that they are somewhat programmable. This means that you can set them up, as said, to do a specific job and they will do that job then they will die off and that will be the end of them. There is no risk of them continuing to divide and, for example, pollute the environment with their particular job. This could be something like breaking down plastics, which could then lead to damaging animals in the environment somehow. That alone wasn't enough for the researchers involved, though. They took it one step further. Once they had these cells that had a finite life, and they had specific functions, they added a gel matrix into the cells. They then shone an ultraviolet light onto these cells, and that led to a wall, so to speak, around them being made. This is kind of like the normal cell wall in some bacteria, or an extracellular matrix. This cell wall made them very resilient to things like pH changes and antibiotics. These are things that are normally used to destroy cells, so having it resistant to them could prove useful in less hospitable environments, for instance. And that's an advantage here. These cells could be used, particularly in industrial settings, to break down material that isn't going to break down of its own accord for an incredibly long time. In other environmental news, we can move across to studies of glyphosate, and going again to births this time. But interestingly, the study makes some very confident conclusions, particularly in the abstract, that just aren't substantiated by the actual research being conducted. The gist of their research, as is in the title, says, down the river, glyphosate use in agriculture and birth outcomes of surrounding populations. In other words, if agriculture, like farms, use glyphosate on their fields, does it affect people in the area who aren't directly exposed? The way they did this was that they sampled water contamination levels, and they looked at the levels of birth that are apparently being recorded. The caveat to this is twofold, and it's why the surprising confidence of the abstract doesn't come through in the rest of the article. They looked at annualized levels of glyphosate use and levels of birth. This is like taking all of the year's data on, say, eggnog consumption and saying that because a huge amount of eggnog is consumed, the birth rate throughout the year is a problem, but it's only ever really consumed around Christmas. And that's the catch. Their data doesn't allow for the estimation of when, where, and how much glyphosate is used, only that so much is used in a given year according to water contamination levels. The second issue is the birth rate data, 
which again is annualized. So, how many births are there per year, and is this related in some way to the use of glyphosate? The simple reality is, no. No, it's not. And the problem with their results are that, as can be easily quipped, correlation does not equal causation. More importantly, part of their own article reads, indicate that glyphosate use upstream from a given municipality is positively correlated with infant mortality, but that the correlation is not particularly strong. The coefficient is statistically significant at the 10% level. That is a big thing here. They are, it would appear, somewhat p-hacking or cherry-picking for results that have statistical significance, as they are only pulling out particular columns or particular sets of data out of what appears to be a much larger set of data. And this is where the study begins to fall to bits. They've taken a very broad analysis, they've tried to extract meaningful data from it, and they're finding that their data isn't generating the results they want, so they more broadly define everything. Going from disappointing news to other water-related news, but a possible way of creating hydrogen using seawater, but unlike regular methods, this is untreated. Salt water, or seawater, has one big problem if you're going to create hydrogen, the salt content. Because of this, it's very hard to break the oxygen and hydrogen out of it separately. Electrolysis systems simply break down over time, or the catalysts involve get, let's say, prioritized by the salt that's there. The chlorine and sodium tends to take up a lot of what's needed, and so you get very little yield for a lot of expense. Researchers used a rather direct solution to this. Rather than trying to remove the salt from the salt water, they instead added an acid to the various catalysts that were used. This acid basically mitigated the chlorine that would otherwise break down or create the precipitates. And this is the solution, basically. It mitigates the issue of the salt in the salt water, destroying the catalysts or the various electrodes used to try and break off the hydrogen. As with just about everything, though, at this point, there are a lot of issues to do with the prototype. And understand, it is a prototype. It's also nowhere near sized to be able to see if it could work industrially or as a commercial product. The biggest problem is going to be that it uses cobalt. Cobalt is not exactly a nature-friendly metal, and so it would have to be investigated as to how best to be able to source it, use it, and then recycle it. Issues to do with water and how we use it are not a new phenomena. In fact, they go back a very long way. Humans have basically had to worry about water since we stopped being singular cell organisms and likely even then. Africa is no exception to this, and Zimbabwe has found archaeological remains that show not necessarily unique, but certainly a creative solution to the issue of what happens when you don't have regular reliable water, like during a drought. The archaeological site has several locations that were historically thought to all be some sort of clay pit. That is, there were large depressions in the ground that were used to extract clay for use in pottery and so on. The Dhaka pits, as they are called, may in fact have a different role, and it, now that we've washed the slate clean on that, we can see that they may in fact have been cisterns. Cisterns are basically large, empty rooms, similar to a water tank, in which, well, water is stored. And the location of the Dhaka pits would support this, being either at the base of hillsides or near rivers. The current estimate for the capacity in the city is something along the lines of 18 million litres of water. Given that the time of its peak, there were approximately 18,000 people present, this water was also used for things like agriculture, and that's further supported by evidence of plant matter growing in the area. That the plants that were growing there were only known to thrive in areas rich in water, and so something like a cistern would meet those requirements. Going from archaeology to an investigation of psychology, and specifically 
how you can replicate and can you replicate the research found within it? The answer is, disquietingly, no for a lot of it. The study basically finds that as far as most research goes, there is a big problem in just how well you can replicate most findings across most kinds of psychological research. This includes developmental psychology, social psychology, cognitive psychology, clinical psychology, organizational psychology, personality psychology. Of all of these, the most reliable was arguably something like organizational psychology. Understand that this was run on two different metrics. One was whether or not it was an incredibly well-cited bit of research and how well it could be replicated. So that gives you some idea as to whether or not people were finding it useful and were they finding that it actually did what it was supposed to do. Arguably, the best of all of this was personality and organizational psychology. The worst were social psychology and, to an extent, cognitive and developmental psychology. Clinical psychology weirdly sits almost in the middle. Clinical psychology and organizational psychology basically straddle the main line between the different data that was collected. So organizational psychology is slightly better, clinical psychology is slightly worse. Psychology is not the only field to be, uh, let's say, getting a lot of negative press at the minute. And negative press is perhaps the nicest way to say this. A AIDS researcher who is quite famous in their own right within the field has had to resign from Hunter College, admit allegations of sexual misconduct, but also findings that they were misappropriating grant money. Specifically, that they had spent money funding a scuba diving trip in Fiji, claiming it was research. Yeah. Understand, the government likes to know where its money goes most of the time, and if you're going to be given a fair amount of it, like they have been, you best be able to explain how you spent it. This is why he now owes more than $375,000. Yeah. This is not a debacle that ends well for anybody involved, least of all the researcher at the centre of the controversy. The whole situation is not just messy, but it's messy because of all the different players involved. You have the researcher in question, you have the City University of New York's Hunter College, you have the federal government, and you have the various ways money was spent other than lavish holidays. Specifically, that it would appear a fairly large part of that was spent on retention bonuses, and that these were not disclosed. This and other recent not-YouTube-friendly infractions ultimately have led to their downfall from fame, not that they haven't returned a considerable amount of money to the university they're at so far, apparently somewhere in the range of $55 million in grant money, so it's unlikely that they'll stay out of the limelight for long and probably find themselves employed somewhere else in the near future. The fact that they have succeeded at all is surprising given that in the future we're likely to find most content written by some sort of AI. In fact, CNET's been trying just this, or at least it's so described. CNET has had many articles written by what they call an AI, but more accurately a machine learning algorithm, without ever indicating that that's who was making these, or more accurately what was making these. The problem is that much of it was plagiarized, if not word for word, content for content. In this case, very few words may be changed, and therefore the sentence structure is exactly the same, where instead of saying they, they might say them, or something to that effect. The presence of a thesaurus function is probably the only thing that saved it from being identified any earlier than it was. The first example given in the article, and they are providing many examples, is how to avoid overdraft and NSF fees. Overdraft fees and NSF fees don't have to be a common consequence. There are a few steps you can take to avoid them, or at least according to their robot. The original source had it written as how to avoid overdraft and NSF fees. Overdraft and NSF fees need not be the norm. 
There are several tools at your disposal to avoid them. The meaning is exactly the same. They haven't even paraphrased it. They've simply rewritten the sentence using new words. And this is not what should be happening. It's also why we specify this is machine learning, not an AI. Machine learning relies on data and then produces content from that data. An AI could paraphrase and recreate these same sentences without having to worry about having just used semantics. The end result of this, at least for now, would appear that CNET has halted the use of the AI as such and will be noting that any article that was published using it will be marked as having been made by the AI. Further, they did claim, although that now has some credibility issues, that all articles that were written by it were supposedly checked by a human editor, and specifically fact-checked. You would think that since you had a human at least going over the articles, they would be able to make some modifications to it that would make the plagiarism less obvious, but yeah. Next, we go from the uh, somewhat dumb to the amazingly dumb, but also thankfully not dangerous. A small, admittedly tiny, capsule full of radioactive material was lost in Australia. Now, understand, we say tiny because it really is. It was a 6mm by 8mm container. That is approximately a quarter by just over a quarter inch. The small container had radioactive cesium-137. Why it contained radioactive material is somewhat funny. It was being used in mining operations to get density measurements. Whoever then lost this must have been incredibly dense because they didn't realize that they had lost it for nearly a week. This occurred back on January 27th, and it's only in the last day or so that they've been able to track it down. Thankfully, they were able to track it down, but understand, this was a very radioactive object that could have caused extreme problems, more so since it wasn't very far from a road, and not very well-traveled road, but a road nonetheless. This means that anyone traveling through there would have had exposure to a small but nearly constant amount of radiation within a certain distance of it. Our final bit of news for you goes from the uh, somewhat amazingly dumb to admittedly pretty but somewhat pointless creations, what's described as a fairy robot. This is a very lightweight robot at just 1.2 milligrams, a milligram being roughly one one gram. The robot is called fairy, but it's an acronym rather than an accurate description. The acronym is Flying Aero Robots, based on light responsive materials assembly. Yeah, it's a tortured acronym. The robot is, in some respects, very similar to dandelion seeds, and that could very well be because that's what inspired it. The idea is that it could somewhat, but not necessarily, compensate for the reduction in bees, although those claims are questionable at best, since it would appear that, for the most part, the common honeybee is not in any danger, and that's worth noting, Rather, depending on where you are in the world, it's possible that native bees may be in danger. The device itself, even if we ignore that, is interesting because it's basically powered and controlled by using light. You could use something as common as LED lights for this, or something as specialist as a laser. The light source or laser does a few different things. One is that it activates an actuator within it. Now understand, this is a tiny, tiny actuator and that, that it's made of a liquid crystalline material. This allows it to open and close the filaments that make up the rest of the fairy. The filaments themselves are 14 microns thick, which is tiny. By opening and closing the filaments, it can create its own sort of vortex, and this allows it to lift up in the wind more easily, particularly hot dry wind, where it could travel a very long distance if it's like its source of inspiration, the dandelion seed, which can travel 10 to 100 kilometers under the right conditions. The only problem with it is, at present, that it's by no means biodegradable, and that would be a problem if they want to use it in the role of a pollinator, 
you need to be able to break these down once they've done their job. Otherwise, you've just deployed a mass of waste material over a rather large area for a single use purpose. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.